ओके तो गुड मॉर्निंग गुड आफ्टरनून एंड गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ फेलो प्रतानी ब्रदर्स फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द ग्लोब दिस अड्डा इज एन इनिशिएटिव ऑफ एग्जीक्यूटिव कम्युनिटी ऑफ विद्यापीठ प्रतानी Uh, it was started in february 2021 it was then the first adha was organized and since uh, we are regularly conducting the praktani adha what is amazing about this praktani adha is that we get to meet our fellow brothers and recollect all the vidyapeet memories and in the process of connecting our brothers also have that opportunity to disseminate uh, the knowledge which all of uh, our senior pakistani brothers have got so that the juniors and everyone else can learn from them and uh, progress in their life and in light of that we have organized this adda which is titled have you thought of a career in civil services now in india two things are uh, like it's a uh, like two things uh, think there is some bandwidth issue with vikas bhai yes uh, we have lost vikas uh uh vikas bhai you can uh, turn off your video and only join with audio there is some bandwidth issue okay okay sir so am i audible right now uh, yes yes please go ahead yeah So I was talking about the craze for civil services in India, especially in the region around the Vidya, like uh, in the region around the Vidya Pit. Like for example, in Bihar, Jharkhand, and Uttar Pradesh, uh, it's like just uh, the craze is just a lot, uh, like at a lot higher level. So uh, I have this short. Uh, I will share a short story with all of you. It's from my childhood days. So uh, when I was uh, around sixteen year old, I got that news that. one of the lady from uh, my village started living in the temple and she started serving that temple and the reason am i audible right now uh, satyam yes you just became you are off for 2 3 seconds okay Uh, so uh, i was saying that uh, the lady who started living in the temple the reason which i uh, came to know later on was that one of his son was appearing for civil services and for last 7 years and was not able to uh, qualify that exam so she thought that maybe might uh, like serving the god might help him qualify that exam and luckily when she started serving in that temple in that very year that his son was selected in civil services in jharkhand public service commission although i do like feel that uh, the faith might have uh, like had a role in that but what i feel was more uh, the greater role was because of the dedication and the perseverance with that uh, civil aspirant which his son had so indeed civil service uh, civil services exam is one of the toughest exam in india and it it takes a lot of uh, like guts to even appear for that exam because uh, the competition is uh, so brutal so for that we need to prepare well and to prepare well we need to have someone who could tell us all about what what civil services is how we could prepare and what we uh, what the media portray us uh, what civil service uh, the media portray civil services as what uh, the real truth is inside the uh, civil services so for that we have conducted this uh, vidya uh, vidyapeet pratani adda without taking much of uh, much time let me introduce the speaker for today's adda but before that let me introduce him he is the deputy director general of foreign trade in dgft ministry of commerce and industry government of india He is also the member of Indian Trade Service Cadre. It's a Group A service under the umbrella of IS Allied Services. His current role involves formulation of foreign trade policy, 
and ensuring its current uh, its correct implementation, particularly for schemes such as RODTP scheme with an annual budget of thirteen thousand crores. He has also done his MBBS from Delhi University, and after doing his MBBS, he served in the healthcare uh, consulting industry, and after that, he opted for civil services and. Since 2012, he's serving India. So, with a huge round of applause, let me welcome on the stage the today's speaker, Dr. Praveen. Dr. Praveen, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Vikas, and I would also thank the uh, very earnest uh, members of this Praktani Adda who have taken pains to start this initiative because i feel that uh, the the caliber and the uh, and the overall uh, life experiences which all of the rkmv brothers who have graduated since like 1922 that far exceeds any other institution in the country that is my belief because the the different kind of careers and different kind of uh, uh, life pass the alum, alumni has taken that is truly mind boggling so in, in that context i i would uh, also like to uh, you know remind some of you about the um, alumni days which we used to have in our commission and uh, uh, every year there was some uh, person from either germany or uh, some of the nations of europe uh, which would you know come and share us, with us some chocolates and we used to listen to them and uh, uh, feel odd about their uh, achievements and the way their lives has taken after they have graduated from our commission. So um, uh, proud to be part of our KMV um, now and, um, uh, and, and this uh, connect will always be there. Uh, the, the idea why I, uh, I thought that probably I can share some, um, 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 uh, some of my experiences to this uh, to this group is uh, I uh, kind of started to think about civil services not in the graduation days. So um, I, when I was doing my MBBS, uh, it was not as if I uh, I thought I would I would be preparing for civil services, but I was more akin to going into the uh, private sector, particularly uh, healthcare consulting and 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 related administrative fields. But uh, then uh, somehow I I got this. Uh, uh, calling from inside that yes, I could uh, take that attempt and probably I'm, I'm more fitted for a career in civil services. That is why this career, this uh, this topic which I chose is, have you thought of a career in civil service? So this is for uh, Praktani Adda uh, 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 alumni which has probably graduated from our commission in year 2008, 10, 12 onwards. And some of them might have even take, completed the graduation. Some of them might be even uh, in the graduation and um, and thinking about whether you are you will be uh, happy and satisfied with a career in civil services is more important right now for those guys and obviously for information purposes for other members who are there in this Prakthani Adda. Uh, Vikas, can you uh, upload that PPT? Uh, sure, sure, we are just doing it. Uh, but yeah, are you able to see the PPT? Yes, the first slide is there. So can we go to the next slide? So first things first, I mean, a lot has been said about the exam, about the difficulty level uh, regarding the so-called uncertainty about the exam. And this is also fed multiple times through various media channels uh, and through the uh, exaggeration of the difficulty level or the uh, the way chance plays in this exam, all said and done, and having taken the exam, I, I would say that this exam is, is about a competition with yourself. Uh, like all, all India level examinations, and in my life, I have taken two exams. I have taken the All India CBSE PMT, through which I got selected into the Delhi University. And then I took this All India level exam. I can say that numbers are irrelevant. 5 lakh people appearing for the exam or 10 lakh or 20 lakh or in the coming times maybe a crore, I don't know. 
numbers are irrelevant because in such competitive exams all good students who think that their metal is in studying solving problems memorizing things analyzing complex issues they want to test themselves to this benchmark and some of the exams like uh, cat and uh, i will also say upsc they have become kind of a benchmark for smart people to test their metal so it is not surprising that uh, you would see that many people who took upsc one or two is guys and also many people from the civil services they don't join the civil services also thinking that okay this was a benchmark i cracked it now i can go for something else so that is there so this this uh, this uh, pedestal to which this upsc exam has been put is is, is one of its uh, uh, one, one of its shining glories and you have to understand that in any year if you are if somebody is taking an exam you are not only competing with all achievers from all streams be it law be it engineering be it medical be it architecture be it medical science so it can be any stream i am coming from multiple years because people take multiple attempts and then there are also a set of people who are actually not who are not in the in the in that so called rat races for different streams in all their life long and yet we are you know able to crack it and are studying for it and i will i would take i will give you an example i have an ips colleague he is from rajasthan until class 12th he studied in his uh, village high school which was there in rajasthan in somewhere near alwar and his name is uh, mr punia uh, he uh, was a normal average student but he was quite smart in his village and everybody commended him for that till class 12th he did not know that what he will do in his life then somewhere in the graduation first year of ba normal ba which he used to do in some of the local city towns some professor told him that you are the smartest kid i have come across in the last 10 years why don't you give it a try to civil services so he thought okay but i have taken only arts and that to hindi medium and i am my subjects are hindi what do i do what subject do i study so his professor told him that oh you are smart enough anything you have to start from scratch so why don't you take sanskrit so that person he took sanskrit as a subject and cracked that upsc exam with sanskrit and history in hindi medium in his second attempt and is now into an ips so there are achievers all over india who actually can crack the exam given the chance and given the opportunity and given they have that motivation so and 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 this example i particularly shared with all, all of you is to give a perspective that it is not that you have to be a born champion or somebody who has topped all his all his career or you have topped in class 10th you have topped in class 12th that might might not help it is only that you should have enough passion and motivation to compete for that exam and you should understand during the process of preparation of that exam as to what does the exam wants from these candidates so i have just as i have said earlier the only competition is with your own self during the exam prep and that exam prep is roughly around i would say 2 to 3 years is is that a time period wherein people sit for the exam and because it's a, it's a long cycle so you have to challenge your so called over confidence if you have been topper all through iit you have been iit graduate you have probably also taken your cat and came out with i am ahmedabad nonetheless there are all, always chances of over confidence built into your personality there are certain beliefs because of so called your relatives who say that you are very smart your biases because you think that your english is top class you can write an essay which can probably put to same people from london school of economics also then self fulfilling prophecies egos and desires so all these things your whole personality is at a class with yourself when you are preparing with your exam prep because this exam is all about resilience 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 so you will be subject to so called torture by some of the subjects which are actually not you know very interesting like medieval history not many people find it very interesting art and culture of ancient india some people might find interesting but some people might not find it interesting then there are topics such as public administration and believe me engineering guys 
do have a loathing for certain these arty kind of subjects so so you have to challenge all that and defeat all that and then create an aptitude and attitude so that you can you know pursue the goal of preparing for this exam and but nonetheless so i could i would always say that this exam does not have a syllabus per se because you know there is a there is a paper of general studies which has four papers 250 marks each in the mains exam 215 to four total 1000 marks and the total number of marks which is total marks which for the exam is around 2375 so around 2375 1000 marks is for you know general studies and this is basically anything under the sun can be asked that is a typical uh, idiom which we use while you're preparing for civil services and that means that by studying the last 10 years papers a candidate is supposed to define his own syllabus the syllabus which has been given by the upsc is only a an indicative syllabus and herein what helps is the aptitude the candidate has because he must be sure as to what he should study and what he should not study also because that will define how is he utilizing his time before the preparation days. So that's why I'm saying and iterating that the exam checks your aptitude and attitude at multiple levels at the time you start your exam and not only on the exam day, because it is you who are deciding what you are studying at what time, which is useful for the exam. And as also emotional question, so there will, since it's a long uh, race uh, and long uh, time period, so emotional question is obviously is something which, which is which is important and but clear focused efforts almost always bring results and i have seen it may not be in the first attempt so overall i would like to share that the the percentage of people who clear in the first attempt is somewhere around 15 to 20 percent majority are second attempt is 20 to you know 60 percent guys uh, i mean around 65 percent guys you know they they clear it in the second attempt and then third, fourth, and the remaining attempts are there. So attempts are multi there are four attempts for the general category. I think six attempts for the OBC category. And then age limit is till 35. You can take if you are from the SCST category. But whatever be the be the be the be the results, this exam process makes everybody humble. However high achieving you have been till the time you start preparing for exam, you would be humbled by the exam and its process and its so-called uh, rigorous requirements. So I have one example. There was one guy, he has done his double PhD in electrical engineering from the MIT after his IIT from Chennai. He was preparing in a room beside me when I took my room in Rajendra Nagar. And after and he has taken the subjects as electrical engineering and physics. And he has, he has a double PhD, mind you. So basically double PhD for people who are aware of the fact is that Somebody who has done his PhD, two PhDs in the four and a half or five years, which is required to be done. So he's already, he was already around 28, 29. And he, after spending five, six years in the US after IIT, he just went into PhD and he was there. But somehow, you know, he, he could not survive in that environment. And after one, one and a half, two months, you know, he was so humble. He said that this exam is probably not for me. And then he left. And he went ahead and probably is now in a company known as G, G Engineering. So it is not like I'm saying that he probably was defeated or he felt he was humbled by the exam, but it says that the exam can actually, the syllabus, you need to have a very hard emotional question, a very tough metal, you know, to keep on going on with the process. So that said, these are some of the myths I try to break. Uh, let us go to the next slide, please. Let us go to the why, let us go to the outcomes, you know. So, so exam is tough, all things are there, but what is it? So once you go into the civil services, we all know, you know, what does a doctor do? Doctor does a surgery, doctor sees the patient. So you are day to day, mostly most of us are you know, interacting with the other professions. You know, what does a lawyer do? You know, what does a, what does a <clears throat> doctor do? You know, what does the police inspector do? You also probably know what does an IPS do because you have seen them in the photos. They are kind of putting some VIP arrangements. They are ensuring the security. But what about the proper IES and what kind of work they are supposed to do or the people who are in the central civil services? What are we doing actually? So, so a career, how is it important? Top 150 or so might get an IES because the seats in the IES are around 180. Total around 700 or 685 people 
get selected every year. Uh, next uh, uh, 20, 30, they get into IFS. Then next 50 or 60 or 100, they get into IPS. And then the remaining 300 or so, 350, they get into different central civil services. The one important fact about civil service examination and its clearance is you get an instant recognition. So the day your exams are out, probably you will not be knowing that many people will know you and start knowing you. So your Facebook photo, if it is there and if there are details enough to let any newspaper know that you are the person who's qualified without your permission, your Facebook photo, your personal life will be out in the newspapers. So it happened with me, my Facebook profile. I was sitting in a kind of a on a normal bed with my legs spread out in a, in a very simple t-shirt, white t-shirt. That was on the front page of the Dainik Jagran of Patna saying that this guy has cleared. And among the other guys, around 10, 15 guys were there. And that was obviously taken without my permission on, on a snapshot from my Facebook page. So that's how so you get an instant recognition and then it, the social recognition continues. So because the level at which, and I would like to stress this fact that Okay, there are administrative jobs. There are jobs which, which are like from I am, you can go to an MBA and you can be at a very good level. But since the government machinery is so big and the entry level job of an IS also, the moment you enter, you are kind of, kind of supervising a, a group of around 25 people. The moment you enter and those 25 people are like much, much elder than you and they have already worked in the government for 20, 25 years. So that is the entry point. So that, Social recognition starts from the day you joined your civil services. Everyone will start calling you, sir, and you are responsible for the work for those 30 to 35 people. And this can, grows on. So, so currently, if, uh, if I am, say, I am the deputy director general of foreign trade, actually, I'm supposed to oversee the work of around 200 people who are working for my scheme in my department or in the Ministry of Finance or Department of Revenue. So that's how it is. So it is like anybody in... The, um, uh, who is doing some work related to my scheme, I'm supposed to supervise that and guide them and do that. So, so instant recognition continues through the theory, through your life. And if you are able to do some really um, high stakes work, like uh, you might have, uh, you might have known, uh, known about Mr. R.S. Sharma, IAS, he has done this good work about Aadhaar. You know, everybody in the government knows him and in the digital governance side, probably he is the icon which everybody looks to for his inputs because the scale in which the government work is done, um, let's everybody know that, okay, you have done this kind of important work. So uh, uh, there was this, so this, uh, if you can see to the fourth bullet point satisfaction, what does this career actually leads you to is, is, is immense satisfaction on many days, you know? And, and this was my interview question. So somebody told me that, okay, you tell me, uh, in, as a doctor, you might be serving a patient and uh, as a as a legal legal person and an advocate, you might be serving the client, but as a civil servant, who are you serving? So that is this that is my interview question. And actually, I had a thought of it, and I, I the answer which I gave was a civil servant is actually serving the idea of India, as envisioned by our forefathers. So they were kind of so called happy with my answer. So I would say that this this. Uh, uh, this idea is this answer is typically kind of encapsulates what you want to do when you are there in the civil services. What is the idea of India? That idea of India is is is, is, is serving basically a society with its ethos, with its history, with its rich heritage, culture, its diversity. Basically, all through your life, you are supposed not to serve your boss only. You are supposed to serve this idea of India. And this itself is a, it is a cause of great satisfaction if you are able to do it in various works of yours. So there is always a greater good which is just so. In whenever you are in a dilemma at, at your in a career in civil services, there is always a greater good, and that always is a guiding principle as to what you should be doing. And all these private jobs, non-coming civil service in a growing economy like India, will always have good opportunities to work the kind of variety which you get in civil service. Uh, growing economy needs an agile civil service. So trans, uh, I miss that S translates into ample opportunities to upskill and grow in a desired field. So you might be in a central civil service working probably income tax, but if you're interested, you can go into cyber security. You can be the top man in India who could probably know about the different ways of Bitcoin and how their financial interactions are happening. 
if you are in trade service you can be the top man which knows about what is going into the global supply chain and and multiple other things so because of the exposure which you get in the central service services the kind of knowledge you can bring to the table to any to the government it, you you have an option to you know develop into that field which you want to and then there is a uh, efft program domestic funding for foreign training which which is there sponsored by the government of india so after 9 years of service in the civil services you can always opt for an mba program or a program in a graduation program in the public policy either at harvard oxford so there are multi programs you can get and that will be funded by the government and then you can come back to the government and continue serving it so and there are various channels based on the interests if someone has all these there things are there in civil service and over the time the government is also you know taking steps to continue skilling us the people who are in civil service so that the needs of the times the the demands of the times are met by the talent pool which which is there in the government of india so uh, that is how the career in civil services is but yeah going back to the first question which is like what do we do basically i would say that we are we are like a uh, we are both a decision maker implementation uh, guy and also a policy maker all combined in one from the day we start so india so you know in a large society like india if everyone is allowed to do everything which is like uh, which is possible then there will be chaos in the society so for like example you know when when you are living in a house you know, there is a law which says that if you are in a 20 foot road then you cannot you have to have at least 8 feet beyond that 20 foot road and then the housing plot starts so suppose this law was not there what would happen in all colonies all people will start their homes from the 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 inch where the road ends right and then you can see all over india how would be the kind of the the shape of the colony so just to give you this fine example there are laws which you know which are has been framed over last 50 60 years which actually govern society so that we live in a we live in a smooth and uh, and and uh, and and conflict less uh, environment so there are laws related to housing there are laws related to economics there are laws related to income tax so we are supposed to pay some tax defined by certain rules and then there are laws related to international trade there are laws related to what kind of uh, uh, mechanisms you can involve what kind of trades you can do so all these laws they are laws okay they have been made but there is somebody who is there to regulate the people who are actually traversing those laws and the there are certain entities which are if violating that those laws then who is going to catch them and make them responsible so most of it is is in the in the hands of the civil services so which as a as a as a so called implementation of the policy and the law they they take uh, um, due action and and try to you know um, i would say facilitate the behavior of a society towards a progressive society so that is how so that is what is the work of the civil services is and this this role involves synthesis of a lot of information crystallization of that information into something which is which goes into making the policy and then probably implementing that policy so over the years that is how it is it is done uh, next slide and 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 these are so this i have taken from one of the uh, uh, documents which is shared by the department of personnel and training so uh, we this we call this four e's so ethos ethics equity and efficiency and these are all self explanatory terms but these are like the basic features of civil services so in in a private job you might have you know a lot of focus on ethos yes because work ethos and overall good everybody ethics also is important equity i am not sure in private jobs i don't think there is something called equity you know bottom line is the most important thing in a private job you will if you you are implementing something and you have, you tell to your bosses that sir i found this i took this decision because it was equitable sorry in a private job equity is nothing you have to you actually cannot uh, you should not be thinking about equity you should only be thinking about bottom line and the prof profit of the company and this is where this is the hallmark of the career in civil services equity is almost as important as anything even impo as important as the efficiency which is supposed to be there so ethos ethics equity and efficiency and whether you are meeting the benchmark set for these in these four principal values that is being 
you know, organ uh, that is being scrutinized the day you join the service. So an officer's behavior and work ethic is under constant scrutiny by your lower up, by the people who are above you, who are to whom you are reporting, and the people who have worked with you. And uh, my advice to people who would have who would prepare and then join a civil service, obviously there are arcane there's a lot of talent pool, is that the first impressions you create in the service in the first few years, three, four, five years, that is going to be there for the lifetime. I mean, it is very difficult to erase your past, past missteps and because you cannot change jobs. You are there in civil service, first five, six years, whatever impression you have made, a lot of what you will get in your work and what kind of impression which uh, will be there, even for seniors, will be there based on what you have done in the first five, six years of service. So, and this defines the so-called concept of ethos because the ethos is a kind of a behavioral trait and it should be there as a permanent. So people should see that, okay, this is a person whom we can rely when we are giving important tasks. So next slide, please. Yeah, so <clears throat> just I thought um, I would go a more deeper about what, what, what does the, what does the general work of civil service and servants uh, encompass? So as I mentioned, ensure in uniform implementation of laws. So the, the, uh, the officers which are there in IAS, Indian Administrative Service, they at the start of their career implement the so-called many, many laws related to education, housing, uh, environment at the local and the state level based on the place of posting which we have. Similarly, we as a members of Indian Trade Service, we actually implement the foreign trade policy at the various field offices which are there in India, all these state capitals mostly. And we implement those, uh, those laws for and govern the trade. And, and this is important uh, because you're not only governing that law, but you're also thinking the context of that law in the, in the overall plethora of, the, of governance. So uh, to sum it precisely, basically governance is not a specific knowledge per se, is it, it is all knowledge combined and then used together to create a progressive society. That is what is governance. So it is actually the master of all knowledges. So in that way, it has a lot of overlap with what, what actually a law is. So the legal, the, the, the so-called legal architecture which has been created by the Supreme Court of India, it governs the laws. So there is, it, there are judges which specialize in very, very technical aspects of science also when deciding about cases. And there are judges which, uh, which are, uh, specialized about fundamental duties and fundamental rights. So it is like, they're also a part of the governance. So you all know there are three pillars of the governance. There is an executive, uh, there is this uh, uh, legal machinery, the political machinery, and we call the press the fourth, fourth pillar of the democracy. So governance is there in all these three, executive and legal. And what we are doing is actually uh, maintaining that rules and regulations, bylaws, et cetera, and then providing inputs to create better laws. So once we are there, we have implemented the policy at the ground level for like seven, eight, nine years. Then uh, there is an option that we can come to the headquarters like I have come in the Ministry of Commerce headquarters so that I can frame better laws which, are, which have higher targeting, good outcomes. And this is how uh, um, um, the various rules, regulations and bylaws et cetera, continue to be passed for better governance. Uh, yeah, now, uh, there is a lot of focus on digital India. So any uh, scheme which you make for the government of India or any such implementation exercise which is being done for the benefit of citizens. For Indian trade service, we are, our citizens are like the various exporters and importers. There is always this angle now of creating an online implementation architecture for citizens and tech schemes. So in the sense that we create the portal, how would the user go there? How would the user uh, uh, achieve his objective? How can he file an application online? What are the things which we need to prompt to him so that he doesn't file it wrongly? And then the delivery of those services, the so-called licenses, permits, et cetera, online, that is also a lot of, uh, that is a significant part of the work which we do. And, uh, uh, and, um, and that is how the digital India, so far the concept is now being brought forth by different, different civil services. And so as you can see nowadays, if uh, someone um, wants to take his, uh, uh, PAN card, he wants to take his uh, importer exporter code number, somebody wants to register himself in, at the Ministry of Corporate Affairs and be, a register, be registered as a company. All these things are now online in the sense that you need not go to the offices of the, of the so-called government officers. So that is how over the last 15 years, this digital India uh, uh, um, uh, paradigm has, has shaped up. 
And then there is another very uh, good kind of work profile which is there in, in the government of India, which is you can always join, if you think that you are one of those brainy people who can actually uh, think uh, ahead of the time and uh, be always ahead of the so-called uh, uh, business curve, then there are think tanks such as Niti Ayog, there are think tanks uh, in different ministries also where you can uh, look out at the various policy initiatives which are there and which can help India um, uh, compete in the, in, the, in the global environment. And then obviously in all such civil service posts, there is always some funds which are lying with you for implementation. So uh, there can be, there will be a significant portion of general administration or account management. So we will be looking at the so-called uh, personal management, the people who are below you, around 30, 35 people, their salaries, their accounts, their whatever um, the permissions they need to take. So that, that part is always there in all, almost all posts only in the headquarters and in the ministries, this role is limited because we are more into policy framing and not into, into general management of people who are there because it's a headquarters, it's kind of a, uh, uh, it's kind of not involved in those general administration things. So, um, like I said, my current role uh, in, in the Department of Commerce and Director General of Foreign Trade is to, um, is a part of the uh, team which actually supervises and uh, analyzes the Remission of duties and taxes on exported product scheme, raw tip scheme. This has the this has the annual budget of thirteen thousand seven hundred crore in 2022-23, and uh, we ensure that uh, the all over India around there are forty thousand exporters who take benefits of these schemes. They do not face any glitches and any system glitches which are there. They are resolved. Uh, this is being implemented through an online platform by the Ministry of Finance. So we we have a lot of interministerial meetings through which we actually. Uh, get feedback on the how the scheme is being run and all. So this was one scheme which actually I had the privilege of drafting the cabinet note for the scheme as to what will be the contours and the various bylaws of the scheme. And then took steps to get it approved by the cabinet. This, it involves multiple presentations to multiple people at multiple levels. And after an effort of around one and a half years, so I was able to, you know, we have our directorate was able to launch this scheme. It was the scheme was launched in August 2021, uh, which is which is the, like I, I think it will be a continuous scheme uh, for like 10 or 15 years, next 10, 15 years. So I can say with some satisfaction that yes, I have been part of the policy making and I have tried my best to what I to the development of the so-called my citizen centric uh, cohort, which is like the exporters. Uh, next slide, please. This is just an indicative slide. So people who are interested in IAS only, and this is the uh, the career graph which they have. So the, at the point of entry, they are assistant secretaries or the ADMs or SDMs. Then uh, they can become the additional district magistrate after four years. After nine years, they can become the district magistrate. And then as you can see, after 30 plus years, they can come to the, the central government, be a secretary or a chief secretary of the state government. So these roles over time, you know, involve a lot of interaction with public. So on a daily basis, I have around two or three meetings with somebody from the exporter community who has some issue. And India is such a vast country, you know, there are thousand kinds of issues because different states are also there. The state's laws are sometimes different. And while we are making our policy, it is not actually always possible to envisage as to how our law can conflict with that state law. So all these things, resolutions are happening daily, day in and day out. And that's how issues of the people are getting resolved. And in the so in, so over time, you know, you first solve problems, and then when you are around ten or fifteen years of your service, you are at a position where you are able to foresee the problems and uh, de define policy inputs so that the problems don't arise. And then at the level of twenty-five years and above, at the level of additional secretary and secretary, you are there to you know take big and mighty decisions, which has which is going to impact lives of crores of citizens of India. So this is the kind of scale we are talking when you're talking about civil services, which is unmatched in any country, except probably for China, for China civil services is also there. So um, um, that is how the scale is. And um, that scale and the and the kind of impact which you can do is what, what actually pulled me and every year pulls many people to civil services because all uh, said and done, life's perks, initially salaries and all, they attract young graduates, young talented graduates who have taken top-notch degrees from top institutes in the first five, six, eight years, 10 years. But after 10 years, 
be for sure and i can tell from my own experience from my own colleagues after 10 years everybody after having their so called financial needs met and everything met they are always looking to you know um, bring some greater change and do something which is kind of will be legacy for them and uh, to them also there is good news in the government of india because in the last 2 3 4 years the department of personal training you know they have kind of thought that yes we have a lot of talent in the private sector also so in the coming years there will be opportunities for people who have not yet worked in civil service to be a lateral entrant to the civil service and they will be given a charge of like 5 6 10 years and if they want to want to continue they can continue so that lateral entry is also on the cards in fact recently we had around uh, 10 12 joint secretary level posts which were advertised and all the people have joined from the private sector and uh, some of them have worked for 2 3 years and then left so that option is also opening so somebody so career in civil service is not actually which is there only for the new entrants so people who are listening to this um, uh, probably in the time years to come there might be vacancies which are advertised by the department of personal training for lateral entry into civil services for high achieving individuals who wish to contribute to the to the governance and to for the better of the society uh, next slide so that was what i all wanted to say there is one slide you can go to next slide which is about uh, my own uh, uh, travels in the uh, in the in the road to the civil services so i would not say that this actually captures what i all have done in the last uh, 39 or so years of my existence but yes some uh, some pick, um, points so uh, many of us can relate to this people who has to have studied in arc mission you know mostly all of us have a lower middle class or middle class of bringing choti choti cheezon ke liye you know we you think that okay had i that had i that not enough toys at home and but yeah uh, general good values and good principles all of us has in the, in in our lives hamare parents jharkhand up bihar kolkata ke aise hote hain west bengal ke kyunki wo hamari wahi that is the treasure which we have so i graduated from rkmv uh, in 1998 and then took my 2000 cbsc pmt my all india rank was 63 then in uh, did my mbbs from delhi university ucms and gtb hospital completed my mbbs then in the mbbs yes uh, again i was you know i was not sure that probably i will continue in medicine so from 2006 january to around 2009 uh, may i think i i worked in healthcare consulting i was in cap gemini invent in their strategy and consulting arm i was posted in mumbai earning good money uh, every night every weekend parties and during those moments only you know i realized that okay is that what is all the life has to offer to me and then some self discovery happened and i thought that i would probably write to civil services there was one personal setback to me 2 3 months after my started my preparation my father uh, expired due to a sudden heart attack all of a sudden but i think um, that made me stronger uh, um, i mean thanks to the support from my brothers also i was uh, able to take the exam and i was all india rank 708 in 2011 exam my uh, subjects were medical sciences and psychology so i am an mbbs graduate so i thought that is better that i take medical sciences because um i already knew the subject and in my time around 10 years back there were two subjects which were required to be opted and nowadays there is only one subject and the general studies paper are four so that is how and since last 10 years i am in the indian trade service uh, that's all about me uh, next slide please uh this uh, obviously somebody can uh, the i think vikas you can share with the alumni and then uh, i just want to highlight here that anybody who is trying to think about studying in civil services the best time in my view to start preparing for the exam is after you have taken two years of your graduation i mean in the from the third year fourth year onwards because before that you know you are not sure about how what do you actually want from your life and uh, what is your aptitude what is your capacity so uh, if you start preparing from at the age of around 21 22 by the age of 25 26 you can enter civil services and that is i would say a good age to enter the services because then uh, you will have uh, enough time to you know explore also within the civil services also as to where do you want to go and uh, so 3 years is given the fact that you probably will take two attempts 
if any additional attempt you add one more year so if you are taking four attempts so probably it will take five six years uh, uh, so and one important thing is one should always choose their subjects wisely and as per interest i have seen many many smart people with overconfidence they took subjects such as physics and history both of them with huge syllabuses and uh, doing good in one subject not doing good in enough another subject now the subject is not an issue because you only have to choose one subject but then the difficult the subject is the higher the course material is the more chances are that you will be ignoring general studies which has a high weightage in uh, in 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 the current civil service exam so choosing subjects wisely after taking a lot of research doing some lot of research is also important so that is all it is in the uh, tomorrow there is exam so people who are there you want to have actually been, been sensitized by today's uh, session uh, all my juniors who are like graduate out after 2015 or be seeing tomorrow there is the civil services prelims exam uh, and uh, the total seats which have been notified by dopt is around 635 and i have listed out the various cadres which are there in the civil services so next slide please so you have all this indian administrative service foreign service you all know there's are ambassadors which of, of of government of india indian trade service also has some of the posts in geneva uh, where when we go as the uh, trade councils and uh, there are other some posts uh, for indian trade service because we are also in, involved in international trade then there is this uh, audit and account service civil account service these are basically accounting services which look after the total budget and um, booking of expenditure etc then we have corporate law service primarily corporate law service sits within the ministry of corporate affairs we have defense account service so all the administration and, and management of defense uh, is done by this service similarly we have defense estate service so all these different services are there if somebody uh, is only keen on ias saying that probably all other services do not have such charm i would not uh, say that this is completely untrue but yes given the fact that somebody who have given 2 3 4 years of his life to the preparation any of the central civil services in the current paradigm is a good option as far as the career in civil services is concerned uh, so that is all i had to share today uh, we can take up questions directly or if some of the moderator members from our practani and they want to add some inputs they are most welcome thank you it was uh, indeed an amazing session we had uh, now i'd request everyone in the audience to kindly post their question or they can also unmute their mic and ask the question directly to the speaker in the meantime uh, bhaiya we have also received some questions uh, via the registration forms so should i uh, like start I, taking the question yes yes we can start taking the questions so bhaiya one question we have received uh, is from abhinav anand uh, he is asking that how to manage the time along with my uh, btech where classes are from 9 to 4:30 hmm so um, it all depends as to um, which is the year which he is targeting for exams so if he is targeting uh, the same year in which he graduates so i think btech semesters for the eighth semester gets over by may or something and then may itself there is a prelims exam so basically it will require one year in this last year for preparation of prelims so that will be difficult but again people have done it so uh, time management is uh, is a is crucial so if he is in the second year he should take uh, the next two years as his as his target and then complete syllabus part by part over the next two years for prelims and gs so uh, the most important is actually setting a target of which year you want to actually give your best attempt so it can be one year after the graduation it will be it can be the zero year even in which you graduated it can be two years it is up to you and that would define the pace and scale of management of how you are managing your time if the classes are from 9 to 4:30 you can take back uh, some um, rest and then you have to burn some midnight uh, oil obviously from 10 to 11:30 or so every day if you study i think one year is enough for uh for uh, getting getting a foothold in the subject area so that you can prepare or prepare well for the prelims at least that is my that is my experience now going ahead with the like before going ahead with the registration uh, other question in the registration form i request uh, like people in the audience to kindly ask a question uh, they can either unmute 
themselves directly or uh, Pravind, i have one query yeah. so uh, this question keeps coming up that the upsc exam is like uh, it is spread over a year and people take multiple attempts at it and five lakh people appearing and uh, uh, one thousand people clear so and they they prepare during the best and most energetic youthful years of their life so somewhere at the end of the day uh, over a period of 5 years 5000 people would get chance others would have to go back to the job market so uh, and like uh, at the end of the day those are the most productive years for any person so somewhere this exam process is hurting the economy or the country as a whole so is there some uh, need of a reform uh, at the, in the examination process itself because uh, you see we make heroes out of civil servants but uh, the, the output we get only a thousand peoples and uh, all those peoples they keep repeating the same process so uh, what's your view on that so i would i would give an analogy uh, to this there are uh, after the launch of this IPL, Indian Premier League for cricket, you would have seen mushrooming of so many, you know, uh, cricketing centers in even small towns. Like I can give an experience of uh, my hometown, Ranchi. I know that there are three, four coaching centers for bowling and batting who are preparing kids for IPL. And in IPL, there are 10, 11 teams. Every team has like 15 people who have who are chosen or probably 20. So 20 into 11, 220 every year. And then there are always 100 people. So in that IPL also, there is only around 150 or 250 people who are getting selected. But still, I think all over India, around at 1 lakh good students or athletes that are practicing. So only around 500 are getting entry. Even I would say that that is a loss of talent. But that analogy is only to give, an expect, is, is, is to give a, a perspective that this is because India is a vast country and there are around 1 crore, 130 crore people with a youth bracket, which is like 65 crore. And in that, if there are, if there is competition that is there, I agreed that many people who, who are not able to clear, they, they would think that they have wasted the most productive years of their life. But my experience is that if somebody, a good student who has not been able to clear the exam, if he's actually, he has realized, he has self-realized, I mean, he has actually matured during the exam process. He will, he would see that he has gained a lot from the process. So I think not many people would know waste more than two, three years without a job in preparation of a civil service. Because in the first two or three attempts, every student knows that where do I stand in this scheme of things? So to say that, uh, I, uh, somebody who has, who is not, who has not even, you know, cracked or given attempted or got more than 50% itself in prelims exam, um, as compared to the cutoff and every year he is getting the same and still he is preparing for the exam. And there is something wrong in that. But if somebody who has, um, cracked the prelims in the first attempt was able to reach to the mains to the second attempt was able to not to reach the mains again in the third attempt for him i would say that he would probably give, should give an, another attempt also because his exam preparation level is at some stage but there are this numbers this 5 lakh numbers is is actually an exaggeration because out of this 5 lakh serious attempts are only around 12000 and the competition is among only those 12000 or 15000 people and from those 12 or 15000 are the people who get selected in the mains and they write the mains paper and then out of those 12,000 or 15,000, 3,000 or 3,500 people are selected for interview. And out of those 3,500 people, 700 or 600 or 800 people are selected in the mains. So if a student who has not been able to clear three times prelims also, and his prelims cutoff is number in prelims is much, much less than the cutoff. I think he is actually wasting his productive years and he should be smart enough to understand that. If the, it is not for the government or for the, for the civil services board to inform him that some other career is probably suitable for you. I mean, to, to put it bluntly, I mean, <laughs> I would not say that uh, this is how it is, but the, the, the people who compete seriously, they know that the competition is only between 12,000 or 15,000 people. And who think and only those serious guys who think that I am only missing the mark by a whisker are actually attempting multiple times. And I, I actually feel sorry for them who, who for who could not who cannot clear 
and even after four or five five attempts are not selected in the mains also or would have selected twice or thrice in mains and not cleared the interview also i actually feel sorry for them and uh, the government also has uh, felt for them and now in the last two three years uh, i would like to inform the audience that there is a parallel list which upsc publishes of the list of candidates who have selected in the mains and they have gone given and got their marks with their subjects and private companies are free to call those guys for interviews and all so that is what one step which the government has done acknowledging the fact that there is a lot of you know waste uh, youth waste youth years wasted while preparing for ups so that would be my answer to that i said why is there so the next question there uh, is that this question is from aditya ranjan uh, he has let asked... me let me ask it directly since i am here and first of all thanks a lot pravin sir for this motivating and insightful session and incidentally i am also from rachi in fact i am in rachi right now uh, your hometown so uh, even i started preparing for civil services in 2020 and i'll give a background about myself so i graduated from i am bangalore from 20 uh, in 2019 and i have i have been working in corporate sector for around 3 years and i am right now around uh, 30 years of age so is it worth for someone to try at this point of time because the age limit is 32 and i just have two attempts left i have my first attempt tomorrow which is like uh, on 5th so is it worth for someone who is in a very settled job and earning handsome and but who wants to do for the country and still like even irrespective of the age like i am at 30 is it worth for someone like me to join the services and yeah, uh, so at that point of time very very prevalent question I, i was just like you in your boat when i was around 10 12 years back so in 2009 when i left my job i was 27 years old and uh, and uh, i already was uh, had a well paying job in healthcare consulting with options to go abroad Uh, because doctors are very rare in consulting yeah. so i was like the prize position for cap gemini because i knew the subject well and uh, somehow people thought that i was very sincere but then also i started to prepare for the exam so just to answer your question there what is your ba- background in terms of uh, so, engineering what did you yeah, do yeah i have okay. i have done electrical engineering IT from yeah. nit calicut in mm-hmm. 2013 so after that mm-hmm. i worked for four years in malaysia in a semiconductor yeah. manufacturing firm and then i did in, in, and then in i am what was your uh, specialization finance it, it was a general mba but yeah i have finance and operation as well yes, yes. so i would say that if see there are certain uh, services which i think uh, adit you should not opt for when you write your mains exam you should yeah. not opt for and those are all the accounting services and the services which are related to defense mm-hmm. you should not opt for because the kind of roles which they have they would probably not interest you but yes is no doubt is a better option yeah. than whatever you are doing right now ips i am not sure whether you have that um, mentality it needs certain a different kind of a temperament yeah. and not to say if you go into services you will build that temperament because you are basically hired for your aptitude and not your background knowledge in civil services you are hired for aptitude the board thinks and it has some capacity to to assess from your personality whether you are whether you are an adaptable flexible person or not so if yeah. ips if it is it is your call you can you can take ifs also it's a good choice yeah. revenue services it's a good choice i would say trade service also is a good choice i would say um, only uh, railway protection for service don't opt for it against any police job because you might not like it but otherwise these five six services are worth attempt okay thanks thanks for the guidance actually i was about to ask like which are the services i could actually opt for and yes. you gave the answer before even i asked it so thanks a lot okay. we have got another question in the chat uh, the question is uh, being an mbs student Uh, i would like to ask what is the procedure of getting into this field after having done mbbs do doctors have any extra age or uh, preference kind of thing in selection uh, yes it is like since you have a professional degree holder uh, at the preparation stage itself you will understand that the mbbs guys have have that some extra age over their you know their capacity of memorizing because we have we are used to studying a lot so we can you know study sit for 12 hours and study and mug a book so so called 
होते हैं मग्गू जो भले बोले जाते हैं स्कूल्स में है ना तो हम लोग एम में थोड़ा वो होता है कि वी हैव दैट कैपेसिटी टू स्टडी एंड दैट इज वॉट इज रिक्वायर्ड इन सोल रिसर्च तो दैट इज वन बिहेवियरल एज विच वी हैव वी डोंट गेट बोर्ड इजिली बाई बुक्स दैट इज वन सेकेंड इज यू कैन चूज योर सब्जेक्ट एज मेडिकल साइंस एंड इन द मेडिकल साइंस मेन्स एग्जाम द काइंड ऑफ क्वेश्चन विच आर आस्ट दे आर जस्ट लाइक योर प्रॉफ एग्जाम क्वेश्चन सो देर इज अ लॉट ऑफ सिमिलैरिटी द सिलेबस इज ऑल्सो नॉट हंड्रेड परसेंट ऑफ वट इज देयर इन द मेडिकल साइंस सर्टन सब्जेक्ट सच एज ई एन टी एन एस सी सी आर दे आर नॉट एक्चुअली टू मच आस्ट इन द मेन्स एग्जाम फोकस इज मोर ऑन जनरल मेडिसिन इन द पेपर टू एंड मोर ऑन एनाटमी एंड फिजियोलॉजी इन द पेपर वन एंड पैथ क्वेश्चन आर ऑल्सो मोस्टली रिलेटेड टू डिजीज सो बेसिकली मेडिकल साइंसेस इज अ वेरी गुड ऑप्शन करेंटली बिकॉज वी हैव ओनली टू टेक वन सब्जेक्ट and med with medical science and with other subjects you we already had spent four and a half or five years in in your clearing your mbbs so uh, you uh, if you are strong enough in your medical uh, science education you can actually devote a lot of time to general studies and uh, come out in the civil service in the first attempt itself that is what my i i what i feel and because i i felt that my preparation in medical sciences uh, was what led me to the civil service because psychology uh, was a different kind of subject i opted for it in the first attempt i scored very well in psychology but in the second attempt uh, in the paper 2 uh, uh, there are there are used to be two papers 300 300 marks each for psychology in the first paper i got 156 which is like 50 51 percent or so which is a good enough mark and in the second paper i only got 88 uh, but in the previous attempt which was my first attempt in the second paper i i, I got 140 so suddenly a de- deviation of around 52 marks and there is no answer why i got so many less marks so this uncertainty was there so uh, this is not there in these uh, technical subjects medical science physics uh, mathematics these are subjects which are like if you have answered the question you know that you are going to get marks so that's how medical science is beneficial and is it helps in my, in, in civil services and from my experience i can tell that tell that out of around 650 or so people who actually got selected uh, around easily 40 to 45 people are from medical background every year Uh, so now we have we have one raise of hand. I request uh, uh, Sanjeev to kindly ask the question. Ah, uh-huh. uh, uh, Dr. Praveen, very nice uh, way to explain and very uh, very smooth flowing session. Uh, I had a query. Uh, this is about the lateral uh, induction. Uh, last year or a, a bit earlier, I noticed an advertisement about uh, lots of posts in various departments. Hmm. and only later i found that uh, a friend a batchmate uh, matched that profile and when i later told him he said that i should have informed him somehow he missed it i mean he was quite uh, matching with the profile i don't know if he would have admitted but he could have applied now the question is uh, in future when such opportunities come uh, what are the kind of uh, things one should be prepared for before applying for those posts because just because you have experience doesn't mean Uh, you will be recruited so if he is very keen on joining what are the things he should be preparing himself with and second is uh, what kind of temperament do you think uh, this person should have to be able to succeed in this kind of uh, profession at such an age of say 45 50 so in short two questions uh, what kind of personality the person should have to be able to fit into this kind of profession at later entry because cultural issues become number one that is two number one is uh especially in case of it or startup uh, field or technology sector or in energy sector uh, what is the kind of preparation one needs to do other than his uh, prior experience that's it mm-hmm. so first i will talk about the cultural fit which was the first question uh so somebody who has uh, who is around 45 or 50 years of age and who is looking at a post of director or joint secretary in the government which is the uh, concomitant contemporary uh, post in the government of india uh, the cultural fit part is the most important because uh, the salaries which would be there will not be matching with what you have got in your private sector in the central government salaries are quite uh, uh, tempered in the sense that <clears throat> even at the age of 40 45 you one must not expect getting more than around 1.8 lakhs per month take home so uh, we don't talk in terms of cost to company because we are in the government so 
at the age of 45 or so, 1.8 lakh per month should be there. So that that one should be prepared for that. And there are perks which are there, which are related to a driver or a vehicle and all. Those are related to different posts to which one can be hired. Now, the most, the second most important thing in the cultural fit, apart from the expectations of salaries and perks, is the the way the government functions. Uh, probably, it is a need of the of the governance that. Uh, at very few uh, ministries or departments, the process of uh, decision making is in teams. Uh, it is often a uh, linear uh, way of decision making, in the sense that the so called uh, assistant secretary is supposed to prepare an analysis of the subject. To that, the under secretary is supposed to give a broad framework of that subject uh, by discussing with different, different uh, stakeholders of different ministries. To, to that note, the so-called director or the deputy secretary is supposed to first prime the higher-ups regarding what is being proposed through an informal channel. Because then, so suppose I'm working in a trade service and I feel that, okay, I've got a very good idea for exporters and I, I want to push this and I want this idea to be built into a law or something. But I might think that I am the most knowledgeable person on this aspect. And I prepare a file and I do a lot of groundwork. And then I put up the file to my seniors and the seniors with their vaster knowledge of the overall paradigm might say that this will not work because this. And I might come with a thinking that, okay, I oh, sorry, I missed this. And then my whole 15 days of work might be wasted. So, uh, this so that's why this linear uh, way of processing is there. So first you have to, but before making a decision, you have to prime up your seniors that okay, this is something which I'm coming up with. To which they will give you some informal inputs, and then the whole policy architecture is built. So there is nothing like a team which works. It's a kind of a linear organization which is which which has some hierarchy, and that hierarchy fitting into that hierarchy is I I find that it has been difficult for some of the uh, some of the lateral entrants, and I can say from. A little bit of personal experience and also some from hearsay. So I, I'm not the expert on this, but uh, you know, people coming from private sector would feel this difference in cultural fit. Uh, decision making is linear, and uh, one should not be uh, thinking that uh, 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 I'm the master in the subject, so what I feel is correct. There are in the Indian government around there are 88,000 people at the group A posts, all of them working in different ministries, all of them have their own. Uh, knowledge and background and also experience of working at the grassroots so uh, that's how it is um, and that is a cultural field part and uh, then the, your second question uh, was regarding the <clears throat> the how should one prepare for these lateral entry uh, posts i would say that uh, as and when the dopt announces such posts there is a good uh, media coverage for that because uh, these are important posts and the government also wants them to be advertised at best as possible so that we can attract uh, the better talent. Uh, there is no written exam or anything for such course. It is mostly an interview and I think around four rounds of interviews are taken as far as I know. And uh, those interviews basically again wants to assess the person's fit into a role in civil service. And in that context, my earlier slide which talks about equity, uh, ethos, efficiency and ethics is important and in uh, and and ethics I, i'm not sure how the the interview panel would uh, would you know carve out the 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 moral ethics component of your personality during an interview but that is an important part um, and in and, and because integrity is something which is very important because we are making high stakes decision and some fraud if it comes out later for a lateral entry would not be good uh, so preparation i think it is important to uh, to assess as to why joining a lateral entry post would be helpful to the government of India. Uh, because every lateral entrant uh, brings to the table a different set of experiences. And um, where does that experience and work uh, uh, and work knowledge fit into the overall scheme of what does the government wants to do? That needs to be highlighted during, during the interview to the interview panel for YouTube selected. Because at the time of lateral entry, uh, the positions to which you are supposed to uh, go are not that well ad advertised. So basically, it's in mostly in central ministries, and you can be posted to a Minister of Commerce also. You can be posted to Minister of Corporate Affairs also. 
and also to the Ministry of Department of Financial Services, uh, probably to Rural Water and Sanitation. So the, there are different posts. So it, that person uh, job fit is something which the candidate has to himself identify and then bring that to the panels because so that the panel can ascertain that yes, you are a good for, fit for that that uh, that post. Um, that is my experience in the sense of I want in Ministry of Commerce we have one joint secretary who had joined. I had talked to him around with with him around five ten minutes about the process. And that is what he could share with me. So I would also say that this is from my experience, my own personal experience. Thank you. Thank you. So we have the next question is from Kumar Vaster. Uh, he's asking, is becoming IS a good career option for people with strong values and skills? And the second question he has asked is, how does honest IS officer cope up with the frequent transfer and average salary at, at start? Are, are they able to serve their objective in practice uh, to serve in real terms? So your question is particularly about an IAS officer. So I am not an IAS per se. I am not in the administrative service. I am in the Indian trade services. But I can say from my experience uh, of the guys whom I know as an IAS is that if you are an honest person, that means you are sticking by your rules and you have bona fide interest of the society in mind. Mind you, the laws are strong enough that nobody can bend your spine. The laws are strong enough that nobody can force you to bend your spine. Two or three transfers, yes, it might happen. But after that, people also know who want to bend your spine that this person is a non-negotiable person and they do not trouble you. And this, in fact, is what is desired from the officers and civil services. Because if you comply too much, you will be taken as a too flexible an officer and then you might land in a suit. So that is one that is one, one typical uh, perspective which I can give you. No, the positions, are, it is called in a steel frame. It is called a steel frame because it is supposed to be strong and resilient in, 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 in times of adversity. So uh, that is my answer to that. Yeah, but we are uh, indeed it is that uh, one cannot like bend this spine, but some sometimes uh, it is also the emotional part as well, because there is a limit uh, which we all have that up to certain level we can tolerate that. Uh, after that, this, yeah, exactly. So I you should you should refer to my talk then. I talked a lot about emotional quotient. The exam process makes you tough enough to understand these so-called emotional play of conflict and all. Once you have managed yourself during the exam process, please believe me, managing other people's are, is, is more easy, is easier. You have managed yourself during the exam process. And that is why the exam process tests a lot of emotional quotient also. Thank you, Vya. Uh, the next question, I think uh, Anand has raised his hand. I request to kindly ask the question. Thank you, Vya, for your time. Thank you, uh, for your time. and. Aditya, we are all, all the best up for the next year exam. Mm -hmm. so Thanks. Question. Thanks. There are two questions. First of all, I'm currently in integrated BBA plus MBA in college at IIM Rotter, and I'm doing my BBA. So I wanted to ask, there is option of lateral entry after a professional career, but is there option like Niti Aayog takes intern uh, from colleges? Is there option for interning at foreign trade office at college level and if there are can we get exposure to those opportunities and second yes, question yes, yes. yeah second question yes. and the second question because you have worked in the medical space uh, healthcare space and then to as a healthcare consultant and now in a foreign trade uh, professional so how do you see the exports uh, around healthcare in, because india is mostly importing health tech product health health tech equipments 90% of health tech and IIT Kanpur is establishing a health tech incubation facility. Uh, and parallelly, we have we are aiming towards export of Ayurveda related products and all of that. Building a healthcare export. How do we transition from being an importer to exporter? Is there any plan around it in case of healthcare sector? Mm -hmm. So two questions are uh, in, in different uh... Uh, paradigm. So the first question was regarding 
uh, the uh, options available at the government for interning. So uh, I can tell you within my department, uh, we have three uh, um, um, positions. One is a level of consultant. One is at the level of uh, associate. And these are all uh, uh, on contract jobs wherein we hire uh, uh, MSc or MA economics guys with uh, some um, uh, roles which are there for MBA people also. Those are uh, advertised from our DGFT website and are available in our parallel organization sister organization is dp iit they also recruit a lot of mba graduates as interns and then they continue the, with them if their performance is found okay in the second year so it is not only about interning for two months between your mba it is also a permanent job and uh, at the uh, young in, uh, professional level which is the first year i think they have a take home salary of around 65 and at the consultant level, they have a take-home salary of somewhere around 80,000 per month. So the options are there and they have been op gradually opening up, particularly in all the economics related or commerce related ministries, DBIT, Department of Commerce, and Department of Financial Services. So you just need to be aware and look at the newspapers because these are well advertised. Uh, and for your question, talking about lateral entry is too early. You are only doing your MBV and MBA. So I would suggest that if you are interested, uh, go for the full full time entry, direct entry itself, uh, just after your MBA. That would be helpful. Uh, I'd like to add to that. I think uh, government of India has also started a young professionals program, and many of the like uh, organization under government of India are floating uh, the rules under that. And also, Startup India and Invest India, they also float the. Yeah, so Invest India, I'm particularly aware of because it is and it comes under my ministry. Invest India has a um, venture between the government of India and some of the states government and some private bodies. It's a trust kind of a uh, trust kind of a company. It's not a PSC. It's now that government department. It's kind of a company. It's, a, it's kind of a trust wherein uh, there is a regular recruit from different IMs, top level um, um, uh, economics institutes and all. And uh, they pay decent salaries, and it's a good uh, work experience which they had, which they I'm, provide. I'm joining Invest India as an intern on 20th. So okay. I will specifically... please, uh, please come and meet me. Uh, my room number is room number 214 in Udyog Bhavan. Sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Anand, uh, Dr. Praveen, may I request? May I request? Uh, Anand, one thing more. In Niti Aayog, uh, they announced their vacancies for interns while doing MBA you can try to join there. It's a good option and they give you good training. Yes, Niti Aayog also does that. So over time in the last three, four years, uh, many good uh, government departments have taken this route because they, they feel that the work experience which can be given to these young professionals who would probably opt for working for two, three years just after their graduation or post-graduation uh, would be a value add for the government and also for those uh, uh, young professionals also. So the second question. Yeah, the second question was about uh, the the role of India as a exporter in healthcare sector. I would say that healthcare sector comprises of two, three, or three, four different sectors. One is the services sector, doctors, who uh, here they treat the medical uh, tourists which come from outside. That is the services sector. Then we have a very, very large pharmaceutical sector which has again two categories, generics and branded generics, and then uh, some biopharmaceuticals. And the third is related to APIs, which is the lower level supply chain raw materials for the pharmaceutical sector. And you mentioned about medical devices, and you mentioned that IIT Kanpur has, has developed an incubation center for medical devices. And then what your question was, what is the government doing for boosting this sector? So I would like to put this in perspective and say that in Southeast Asia and also from Middle East, uh, apart from Thailand, which is also competing in terms of medical tourism, India is the leader in, uh, in medical uh, tourist services. We have a lot of patients coming in from Middle East, Iraq, Iran, uh, Pakistan through Dubai, not directly, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, uh, as far as Taiwan also, because the prices here are good and people often club their medical surgeries with some uh, normal tourism. They would have their surgeries done and then visit Agra and uh, Jaipur forts and then go back. So medical tourism is on a good, good, good pace. Obviously it was impacted a lot during the last two years of COVID, 
but now it has again picked up. So that is my uh, two words about that. Now coming to the pharmaceutical industry, we are among the top exporters of pharmaceutical formulations uh, in, in, in the world. Um, in many forums, our industry also cherishes itself to be called as the pharmacy of the world. Although that might not be quantitatively, quantitatively true in the overall sense because many companies which are global leaders like Teva or uh, even the generic arm of Pfizer and all, they are based in Israel and in US. But in terms of supply of generic medicines to the world, India is the leader <clears throat> apart from some other countries like um, in, in uh, Germany is there and um, which particularly markets to Europe. What is India currently not very strong at is the uh, lower level raw materials, uh, which are the which are called the APIs, the active pharmaceutical ingredients. Most of the APIs in India are now being imported through China because China is the larger producer of many chemicals, many uh, down the line chemicals uh, um, because of its uh, early start in that field. And and but all these APIs are imported by India, and then the Indian companies with their strong uh, uh, formulation uh, expertise. They create capsules, tablets, syringes, and all such other ready-to-use uh, medicines from those active raw ingredients, and then supply it to the world market. Regarding the medical devices, you are true to state that around 85 or 90% of our medical devices are imported from outside, because this is one sector which is highly technology intensive, and the leading uh, countries in the world which own the patents of such high-tech medical devices, be it a CT scan machine, MRI machine, a linear oxygen accelerator machines and uh, different kind of uh, robotic surgeries and all. They own the patents, particularly in Germany, Switzerland, uh, uh, Italy, and uh, some of the, um, obviously US is always there. So they don't want to share their patents and they have not been very keen to, you know, invest in India and transfer their technology also to India for such medical devices. Now, government of India understands that and the Department of Pharmaceuticals has recently in the last year launched a production link incentive scheme for medical devices, uh, which actually is a scheme which uh, put some seed funds uh, as an incentive to companies who are willing to uh, establish new um, greenfield plants in India for manufacture of medical devices. And the devices can be anything. It can be stents, it can be CT scan machines, it can be MRI machines and all. So that is one step which has the government has taken in the last two, three years, new step, obviously, over the time, multiple such initiatives have been taken. And that is why initially when I graduated in 2005 or six, I remember that uh, the so-called Littmann stethoscope was the standard in terms of stethoscopes to be all medical graduates used to use. And that was not made in India, but now I'm told that some Littmann scope, stethoscopes are also being now being built in India. So in the last 20 years, we have come far across and but there is more to go medical devices is a very challenging technology intensive sector and uh, i hope the pli scheme for the medical devices is successful and in the next five six years some uh, foothold uh, can be made by indian companies who are into this sector so some of the companies which are i would not say are indian but they are owned by the private uh, other brands in, in in europe like philips siemens and all these can all these companies they have started investing in india uh, with a limited part of technology transfer also. Let's see how it all pans up in the next five, six years. Yeah, the next question, I think uh, some part of uh, it uh, has already come over, but I would like to uh, like request you to take it up again. The question is, uh, I'd like to know the choices and ways for a medico to enter in the relevant civil services and the ways he could serve the nation in best way, either as doctor or as a civil service. This, uh, <clears throat> see, serving a nation is is, is a good uh, is a good uh, life goal. Being a doctor, also you can actually serve serve your nation pretty pretty well. And this was a, in the both the interviews which I took. This was a prime question. I and it was asked posed to me that uh, suppose you are a super specialist and uh, you become you are a, from a good college. You do your uh, MD in cardio and then you do your DM in cardio and you only operate and stunt, do some angiography and stunts. Every day, even if you do two, in your lifespan of around 40 years, you will be able to help around 2 lakh people directly. So this was my question from, a, from an interview panel member, that you will be able to help 2 lakh people in the sense that you will be giving life to them. Now, can you be able to, will you be able to give life to 2 lakh people in your career in civil services? So that was a blunt question put to me. 
so you have to actually understand that these questions are there is no right or wrong answer to these questions and for so for a doctor who has actually it's based on your aptitude if you think that looking at a patient making a good diagnosis and then following it up with that patient and making him treat and then doing this process all over again again all your life is giving to give you much more uh, pleasure and kick then i would suggest that you go for a career in medical uh, sciences and be a doctor and super specialized rather than going for civil services just it should civil services should always be a pull pull factor it's a pull choice it should never be a push choice so you should not be thinking that oh, okay i am getting bored in medical science so i should probably opt for something else okay civil services is a good option why not go for it sorry it will never work civil services as a choice as a career should always be a pull and this pull comes from your own soul from your own uh, self discovery from your own analysis of your thoughts so if somebody is very happy doing whatever is doing as a doctor i would suggest that he should stick to that path because materially even i would say societal recognition wise i would say person satisfaction wise medical service medical job medical career is also a good job in india particularly in the current times when you have you know all the facilities even at the small places so 10 years back i know there was no online facility so you many complex patients also terminal patients used to come to delhi but nowadays with a lot of tele medicine tele consultation a good uh, doctor has a lot of network he can do a video call over a tough patient and then get his inputs and get a feedback and serve a patient well in a in a small town also so technology is evolving and it is helping every career and also a medical career so that way uh, it is for the personal personal choice of the person so to so that would be my answer to that question yeah i do agree that we should not get lured by the prestige and uh, the power that these civil services carry but rather by the like what passion and what makes us happy yes because the, these uh, terms such as prestige power obviously i understand these these are good societal pulls you know instant recognition is there it is continued all your life wherever you go you will be introduced as okay this and this batch is or this and this batch in entered service so you feel elated and all but these are all superficial things frankly my being in service i can share my experience that <clears throat> if somebody is very satisfied with his job he would say that okay is is also just another job and people who are not satisfied with their job they would always see civil service as something which is like the greatest job in the world so it is just like that <laughs> but yeah the next question uh, i have got is that does government if, uh, government of india proposes any all india service cadre in allied group in allied in health services no uh, it it is not related to health so yeah uh, it just a plain question that whether uh, government of india proposes any all india service cadre in allied group in uh, i could not get your last word allied group yeah all india services in allied so uh, there are certain uh, thinking which are going on but this is nothing is on paper i would not be able to comment on it yes there are some thinking that probably all the account services uh, should have a similar role and work and similarly all the uh, commerce and industry related services should have similar role and work but currently uh, nothing is on cards which i can say that yes it is government is thinking in that way in fact so i am not the government so i should not be committing it i am uh, part of this session as my in my personal capacity so <laughs> that is indeed uh, yeah, uh, yeah. is there any uh, such a scheme for health services uh, because the next yeah so in the recently the last that's why i thought that probably this question is about the health services around 15 or 20 days back there was a, a, a decision uh, some newspaper article which says that probably india is mm. looking to you know uh, uh, to create an all india health cardio services which mm. is important given the fact that we have too many government hospitals at multiple levels at the tertiary care and primary care and secondary care which require better administration better account management better service delivery so that is there and that has been a long standing demand of the different health services cadre which are there in the government so the, i think that should that should fructify and it should benefit everyone everybody all of us yeah uh, uh, there is one last question i'm really sorry that uh, i'm asking so much so many questions from uh, you uh, so this question is there yeah, uh, what are the documents required to import pet uh, like yes pet so i saw this yeah exactly good and um, uh, i am um, happy that i can help you in this directly because 
uh, one of my colleagues is looking at this division. So you can personally connect with me uh, and you can email me and you can have my mobile number. There is a permission which is required from, there is one import uh, form which has to be done and then you have to submit that application to the headquarters online. And then we, for the, that breed of uh, the pet which you are importing, we take some input from the Ministry of Animal Husbandry. And after those inputs are come, have come and they okay the proposal, then we allow you to import that uh, pet. Thank you, Priya. I will. Uh, yeah, connect personally. I will share the details because this is some normal forms and all which are there. Typical uh, government uh, processes. Okay, I will forward uh, uh, the answer to the. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Please, you can connect with me personally. Yes. Uh, anyone else like to ask any other question? I think we are uh, we are done with the Q and A Q and A round. Uh, so, could we go ahead and uh, like with the wrap up round? Wrap up. Yes, I think uh, no more questions. So we can so because we can wrap up the session now. So, uh, Praveen Bia, I'd like to thank uh, for like uh, doing this other session. It, it was like uh, we learned a lot a lot of things from you and. Uh, the session also, I think uh, it helped a lot of people uh, like clarify uh, most of their doubts. And one of the things which I liked, uh, like you, when you said that uh, if a person has a strong spine, no, no one can uh, ban that. I had this question like uh, since very long that how a person, an honest person survives uh, in, in that place because um, every day we, uh, like we hear all the story about the corruption, which... Uh, which certainly is something uh, which the government is working upon. But uh, it was indeed an excellent uh, session. And uh, I, I thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of everyone presenting the meeting and on behalf of uh, Lakshmi. It was a privilege talking to all of my um, um, brothers. Um, uh, anybody who was coming to my office area, Udyog Bhavan, Central Delhi near uh, India Gate, North block and South block. Uh, please uh, give me a call. I will be happy to host you. Uh, that's all. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so, uh,